Greetings, everyone. We're going to start part two of our chapter three discussion, um, looking at our add to assembly code. Um, just a quick review. You can see the different sections. We've got the code section. Um, and then above the code section, we have some definitions. We have the definition of the exit process function um, and a few other things. This is a format that we're seeing here that is specific to the 32-bit assembly language code. The 64-bit, which we will look at from time to time, uh, has a similar structure, but some of the prefixes at the top are not used because we're using a 64-bit operating system and uh, CPU rather than 32-bit. So this one we can see is basically adding two integers. You can see the in the main procedure, there's basically just two steps. We have a move, which is essentially putting a particular number into one of the registers, in this case, the EAX register. So we are moving the number five into the EAX register in the first step. Then we are adding six to whatever is in the register. So we moved five, then we're adding six. So the value that it's going to be, and you can actually see this on figure three, five in your book, um, the value is going to be 11, but it's shown in hexadecimal. So it's, it shows up as B because we have nine, one, uh, 0 through 9, and then 10 is A, and 11 is B because hexadecimal is base 16. So pretty simple uh, code here, but this is just the example we're starting with. Here's an example of, the, of what we see in the debugger. And you will go through a process, or probably already have, uh, when you do when you work with the add to code in Visual Studio. There is a registers window that you can open while you're debugging, and it shows you essentially the value of the register as you step through the code. So you essentially see all the registers and the different segments and so forth in real time as you step through the code. So this example actually doesn't show the results from the previous. Uh, if the, pre the values as they would look after running the add to, uh, you would see those values in figure 3.5 in your book. Next we've got coding standards. Every language is going to have some differences. Um, I'm not going to mandate any coding standards for this course, but the, here are some, some basic suggestions. You either, you know, you can capitalize nothing, capitalize everything. I like um, the idea of capitalizing reserved words. Um, I think that's helpful. And so, but it's sort of up to you and it's dependent on the organization you're working with, what coding standards they've developed. A lot of coding these days is uses camel case, you know, which starts lowercase but uses mixed case so that we can best and most easily identify variables and values and so forth. Um, and I think comments are good. In, in assembly, comments are prefixed by a semicolon, and I generally see them to the right of the page on the same line as the code they're describing to the right. Um, one thing here is when we have an instruction, in this case the move is the instruction, we put several spaces between it and the operand. So in this case we're moving the AX value to BX, but you can see that there's multiple spaces between move and AX just to indicate uh, since we're not using a parentheses, which is sometimes used in other languages, using extra spaces gives us a sense of, okay, this is, a, this is an instruction on the left and the operands or the inputs and outputs on the right. And here's an example of a program template. Again, we're looking um, uh, at a 32-bit example here, but we've got, you know, some basic comments at the top, 
the description of the program, who who wrote it, when it was written, when it was revised, the date. This is all pretty standard. Um, and you'll see this in in other coding languages as well, obviously using their comment methodology. And then we have the main, which is our main procedure. Um, we have the data area, um, the directive, which is the area where we're going to declare variables. So pretty standard, but you can see that this is kind of the paradigm. You might copy this um, and use it for your future code as far as turning in a, uh, ASM files. Next, we're going to talk about the process of actually executing our assembler code. It goes through a bit of a cycle, a bit of a process. Uh, you're probably familiar with compiling if you've dealt with higher level languages like C++ or Java. And there's some similarities here. The assemble process is similar to a compiler. So you can see in step one, we start with the source file in the text editor. The first thing we're going to do with it is we're going to run it through the assembler. That's going to create an object file similar to the compiler. The extra step we're going to do here is we are going to run a linker, and that is essentially going to check our object file for any connections to external libraries, any functions that might be found in other libraries. So if those are indeed referenced, those are going to be included then in the output of the linker, which is the executable file. So the executable file is going to contain the object file uh, that was generated by our assembler along with any relevant files from linked libraries. Once we have that executable file, of course, we can execute the code um, as you would any executable. Another concept which you'll find in the homework is the concept of a listing file. Um, and this is pay, uh, around page 71 in your book. And it essentially contains the code from your ASM file, but it also contains, it's essentially like a debug output. It's going to show the registry values as you go through each step. And those are going to be shown in essentially hexadecimal, you know, an eight digit hexadecimal number. It's also going to show the values of the instructions. The instructions themselves actually have unique hexadecimal values. So it's actually, it's more than the register window shows, which only shows the values in the registry. This is going to show essentially a, a debugging output of our code from start to finish. Next, we're going to go over uh, defining the different types of data in our code. First is a concept of intrinsic data types. Intrinsic essentially refers to the fact that the data type is defined by its size. Is it 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, etc.? So when we're talking about intrinsic data types, we're talking about data types assigned basically by their size. We've got byte, which is 8-bit, word, which is 16-bit, and so on. And essentially for each one we have a version which is unsigned, which means it doesn't know or have any information about the plus or minus, whether it's positive or negative. And then we have the, the signed integer, which essentially is prefixed with an S, letting us know that that's signed. If you recall, we have our data types we discussed earlier, including byte, word, D word, and then of course real. Next we have the data definition statement. This essentially is going to be in a segment of our code prior to the execution of the code, and it's going to set aside storage in memory for a variable. And we have here the syntax. We don't have to, but we can give it a name. In this case, the name is value one. That's essentially the name of our variable. We have our directive or our definition, 
In this case, it's a byte, which is an 8-bit. In this case, unsigned integer, and then the actual value. In terms of defining bytes and s bytes, here's a few examples. If we include a character with quotes or, or double quotes around it, it's defined as a character. You know behind the scenes, we know that the capital A is stored in, hex, in hexadecimal as the number 65, uh, but it's a character constant. Second example there, we've got the smallest unsigned byte, which is zero. We have the next one is the largest unsigned byte. Remember, a byte is eight bits of data. It essentially is a number between zero and 255. So that's our range of values for a byte. The signed byte has the same range of values because it's eight bits, but it includes the sign. So you can see that its smallest value is negative 128. Its largest value is 127 for a total range of 255. Uh, but because it allows for negative values, it's going to span not 0 to 255, but negative 128 to 127. Finally, if we have a question mark, that essentially leaves the variable uninitialized. And that implies that we'll, of course, assign it when the program actually runs at runtime. When we're defining an array of bytes, we do that. Similar to similar, except we use a comma delimited list to show the array. So in the top example there, we have a, an array of four that are all bytes. First one has a value of 10, the second one has a value of 20, third one 30, and the next one 40. In the second example there, we actually are defining list two as an array of bytes, and there's actually 12 in that case, because if we don't put a label for the second two, it's assumed that they are a continuation of the first. Finally, list three and four, um, when we're using a, that's, a, that's considered a multiple initializer there. For list three and four, um, we can actually, they're just examples of how we can use different radixes, if you, radixes, excuse me, if you recall, we have a binary option, a hexadecimal option, um, and then just a regular decimal. So we can define our data a variety of ways as long as we have the correct or appropriate radix identifier. So the value, uh, you see the second value in list three is 32. Since there's no radix, it's assumed it's decimal. In list four, the second value is 20H. That's actually the same value as 32 in hexadecimal. You can see it's base 16, a value of zero in the first column, and a value of two in the second column. That means two sixteens. Two sixteens is the value 32. For defining strings, <clears throat> it's essentially an array of characters, probably like you're familiar with from any high-level language that you've learned. It's enclosed in either single or double quotes. Uh, the one sort of difference here, this is actually in a byte array, which we just talked about. And, but in the case of strings, the byte array does not have to be separated by commas, just enclosed in quotes, because having all those commas in there would be really tedious. One other difference you'll notice maybe from some high-level languages you've used is that it ends with a what's called a null bit, which is essentially that comma zero at the end there that indicates that the string is over. If we want to continue a string across multiple lines, we do what we just did earlier. We define the string, we define the directive, the quotes, the double quotes in this case, and then we add a line, a carriage return, and a line feed, which is essentially those hexadecimal values at the end. Um, you might be familiar with slash n and slash r in C or C++. This is similar to that. It's a carriage return and line feed that allow the string to go essentially to the next line. So the 0dh hexadecimal symbol is a carriage return. The 0ah is a line feed. 